If you have a Bible this morning, find your way over to the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. If you open your Bible up about halfway, you'll end up somewhere in the book of Psalms. Go to your left and then you'll quickly get to Nehemiah. It is a gem of a book that we very seldom spend much time in. But fortunately for us, we spent three weeks earlier this year going through chapters one and the first part of chapter two. Today we want to finish up chapter two and we want to talk today about leadership at a crossroads. How do you motivate other people? That's exactly what Nehemiah had to do. You'll remember the scenario is this. Nehemiah is recording for us in this book his personal journal, his leadership journey from going from a cupbearer to the king to being the man whom God burdened to go back and rebuild the walls around the city of Jerusalem. You and I cannot fully appreciate that because we don't think much about walls these days, but in that day and in that age, a wall was an absolutely essential and critical part of protecting a city. So when a wall was down, that means that they had been overcome, they had been overtaken, they had been defeated. And that's exactly what took place in 580 BC. The nation of Israel, the city of Jerusalem was overcome and they were taken into a, 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 a bondage, if you will. They were taken as slaves. And for over a hundred years, the city walls of Jerusalem had remained in ruins and the gates had been burned. Nehemiah's brother takes a visit to Jerusalem and when he comes back, he asks him for a report. And his brother gives them a report that the people are discouraged, they're defeated for over a hundred years now. This wall has been down, the city has been exposed, and more importantly than anything else to Nehemiah and to his brother was, God had been shamed in it all. Nehemiah's goal was the pursuit of the glory of God. And so he prayed, and he planned, and he prepared, and God was gracious to him showed him his favor. And now we pick up the story in verse number nine. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. He had an armed guard escort. He didn't ask for it, but God's hand of favor and blessing was upon him. The king not only asked, gave him all that he requested for, but he gave him even more with this armed uh, uh, entourage to keep him safe. Verse 10. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite, these are, uh, uh, this is the part of the story where you go, boo, these are the villains of the story. They, they are throughout the story. They're the bad guys, if you will. They are the, uh, uh, the ones who will see, did not want to see that wall rebuilt. They wanted to stand in opposition to Nehemiah. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So I went to Jerusalem, and, and I was there three days. Then I arose in the night, and, and I, I and a few men with me. And I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. Thank you. That was the emphasis right there. Did you hear that? Did you pass that video on to somebody else in here? There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate to the king's pool. But there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Literally, the rubble was so thick that the animal upon which he rode could not make it through on solid ground. Then I went up, to, went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall. And I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. And notice this. And I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. 
But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servants of Geshem, the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper and we his servants will arise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. What I want us to discover today is, is basically eight principles that Nehemiah employed that we can extract from this text that help us understand as leaders how to effectively motivate others. Principle number one that we see here in this text is this, plan on opposition. Plan on opposition. Look at verses 9 and 10 again. It says, Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them kings, the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen, but when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So here are these two guys. In all likelihood, they are close by city officials, and they didn't want to see the walls of Jerusalem rebuilt. They didn't want to see Jerusalem prosper. They were against what Nehemiah was all about, what Nehemiah was burdened for, and what Nehemiah had dedicated his life to from this point on. And so they stood in opposition. Anytime you will take a stand or do anything for the kingdom of God, you can absolutely, positively expect opposition. Now listen to me this morning. If you have never experienced opposition for the things of God, the reason is simple. It's because you are going with the flow. But if you are going to do things for God in this world, you are going to be swimming upstream every moment of the day. And when you are swimming upstream, you are going to face opposition. Mark it down. Don't act surprised. It's going to happen because the enemy of your soul his job description according to John chapter 10 and verse 10 is to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And he wants to kill, to steal, and destroy everything in your life, especially your relationship with God. And when he cannot attack your relationship with God, he will do everything to attack you any other way that he possibly can, physically, mentally, relationally. He's going to work at it because he wants you to be absolutely, positively miserable. Expect opposition. There is no opportunity without opposition. And opposition will either wear you down or polish you up. Opposition is like sandpaper. It'll either wear you down or it's like a cloth to a diamond. It'll polish you up. Plan on opposition. Principle number two we see in verse number 11 is this. Patiently wait for the right time to share the vision. Patiently wait for the right time to share the vision. Look at verse number 11. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Now, it's real easy for us to read a verse like that and just kind of pass right on. So what? He was there for three days. Well, you got to ask yourself the question, what was he doing for those three days? Well, maybe he was resting. I mean, this was an 800 to 1,000 mile journey on the back of a camel through the desert. Now, a couple of weeks ago, my wife Cindy's dad had a stroke. And so we very quickly had to pack up the car and head down to Florida. We made it to his house in about eight and a half hours, which is about an hour and a half faster than we'd ever made it before. And when I got there, to be quite honest with you, I drove the entire way. I just wanted to relax because I had been focused. I had been, you know, and, and, and we stopped, get the gas, go to the bathroom, get the drink, let's go. We ate on the road because we had a, a mission and a vision and, and we were going to do this thing. But I was slap wore out. I don't understand how sitting down for eight and a half hours, basically, getting up every two or three hours to walk to the bathroom and to put some gas and wears you out, but it does, doesn't it? And so here's Nehemiah. Maybe he's resting. Maybe he's praying. He was a man of prayer. We see prayer throughout the entirety of this book. We already looked at his first prayer in chapter 1. And we, we read that, that when he first heard the news, he spent four months in prayer and in planning. 
And maybe that's what he's doing. Maybe he's doing a little more planning. He's putting the finishing touches on his, on his master plan. Or maybe he's just building curiosity. I don't know what he's doing, but for three days, he's waiting for the right opportunity to share the vision. Just like he waited for four months before he ever shared the vision that he had and the burden that God had given him to King Artaxerxes. Principle number three, pull together all the pertinent facts. Pull together all of the pertinent facts. Now, in verse number 12, we begin a series of things that he did. Look at what it says. It says, then I rose in the night and he went through and he checked out all of these gates and he, and he rode through and he did a, an eyeball examination. I'm not going to go through and read it. We read it just a moment ago. But here's what he's doing. He's finalizing everything that he thought. You know, sometimes you hear something and when you go to see it, it's just not exactly the way that you thought it was when you get there. And so he's just reaffirming, he's reconfirming, if you will, everything that he had thought up to this point. So he's getting any last minute details, any last minute thoughts that maybe somebody else overlooked. And so he, he's pulling together all of the pertinent facts because they are absolutely essential. You see, an effective leader doesn't fly blindly. An effective leader gathers all the facts before they make a decision before they launch out and accomplish something. And so that's what we see here is we see that not only did he plan on opposition, not only did he patiently wait to share the vision at the right time, but he pulled together all of the pertinent facts. And that's what he was doing, but this is inspection, verses 12 through 16. But then notice down in verse 17, and we see several truths here in this one verse alone. And principle number four is this, put yourself in others' shoes. Put yourself in others shoes verse 17 then i said to them you see the trouble we are in it had been easy for nehemiah this highfalutin basically he was a slave but he'd risen to the king's right hand man to come in and say i am here to save the day who was that, that was a cartoon that did did that right i am here to save the day what was that is a Mighty Mouse, thank you. I was thinking of some cowboy, but I was wrong. May have been some cowboy too. All right. <laughs> mighty Mouse. How many of you got a Mighty Mouse t-shirt? Never mind, now. Here I am to say that. He could have done that. I mean, he had an armed entourage, an escort. But what did he say? Listen to it again. You see the trouble we are in. He put himself in the people of Jerusalem's shoes. In 2002, Mel Gibson starred in the movie We Were Soldiers. He played the role of Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore. He had a bunch of young green servicemen. And he said, we are the new cavalry. And here is our horse, and you can see by the hangar the helicopters fly by. And he tells his men, he says this, when we go into the battle, when we go into the battle, I will be the first to set my foot on the field, and I will be the last to step off but we will all go home together. That'll motivate. That'll preach. Principle number four, put yourself in other shoes. Principle number five, and you gotta listen faster, guys. Come on, please turn the speed of your ears up a little bit, all right? Principle number five, present the reality of the situation. Present the reality of the situation. Again, verse 17. Then I said to them, you see the trouble that we are in. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. He reminded them. Why? Because they had become complacent towards the walls being down. Because for over a hundred years they had been down. That's all these people had known. 
There were a couple of attempts through the decades to rebuild, but they all fell flat. If you come to my house and you walk up my walkway and I've got this huge crack in the sidewalk, you're thinking to yourself, why didn't this guy fix this huge crack? I could fall in. It is so big. When I go to my house and I walk on that same walkway, I just instinctively step over it because I am so used to it. I am so accustomed to it. I don't even see it anymore. And that's where the people were. So Nehemiah had to remind them, this is our current reality. He was gathering facts earlier for himself. Now he is sharing those facts with the people. Because change never occurs until there is enough pain or enough discontent to take action. I know I got to lose weight. Now, I've given some flippant attempts to it. But when the doctor says, hey, you, you've got type 2 diabetes, and if you don't pay attention to your health, not only are you going to have to make some radical changes, it could be devastate you. I know I should eat better. When I go out, I love ribs and I love burgers and I love fries and I know I should eat better. It's not doing any good for my heart. But until my chest begins to cave in on me and I am laying face up in a hospital bed, you see what I'm saying? Until there is enough pain or enough discontent, things aren't going to change. And so that's what he does. He presents reality of the situation to the people. Principle number six, pursue a definite response. Pursue a definite response. Again, verse 17. This verse is just chock filled. And this, listen to what he says. He says, he says, he says, come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. He didn't travel all this way. He didn't do all of that praying. He didn't do all of that planning just to say, come on, guys, let's get together. What does that mean? He had a very clear and distinct and definitive response that he was looking for. Get your tool belt, get your trial, get your wheelbarrow, and join me as we build the wall. You got to ask specifically. Or else you're not going to get anything specific. You see, effective leaders see both what is, that's current reality, and what could be. And in order to get to what could be, they ask for help. Nehemiah couldn't build that wall on his own. Goodness gracious, he was a cupbearer. He wasn't even a developer. He wasn't a carpenter for all we know. He wasn't a mason. He wasn't any of those things, but he had a burden. Principle number seven, proclaim your own story. Proclaim your own story. Verse 18, look at what he does next. This is brilliant. This is leadership gold, gentlemen. Verse 18, and I told them of the hand of my, how the hand of God had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, listen, at the end of this, after he shares his story, right? After he says, here's what happened. I had this burden. I was praying about it. I was planning for it. I was before the king. He saw my face was downcast. He asked me what was going on. Boom, I prayed a quick prayer, and then I shared the vision. You know what he did? He gave me everything that I asked for, and he gave me even more. And, man, that started to get the people excited. They said, you know what? I think God might be in this. This could be something. This is unique. This is different from anything that we've ever experienced before. This is good stuff. And what did they say at the end of it? They didn't say, oh, man, here's another one of those guys wanting us to rebuild the walls. He thinks he can come in here. Mighty mouse here to save the day. But all of a sudden, they said, let us rise up and let us build. What a moment. What a day. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, he said, be imitators of me as I am an imitator of Christ. Proclaim your story. 
I, I know what we think sometimes. Sometimes we hear a guy get up and he said, you know, I was five years old and I was a crack addict and, and you know, and, and I had stolen money from the bank. And, and we think we don't have a story like that, man. I grew up basically a good kid, you know. I, I never did anything terrible. The worst thing I ever did was whatever it was. And we think we don't have a story. You got a story. And, and God says, I want to use your story. Your story is, is just that, your story. And you know what? You may be able to argue a lot about me, but you can't argue against my story because my story is my story. And God says, I want to use your story, Maurice. I, wanna, I want the world to know me in a better way because of you. And so you share your story. And then principle number eight. Good night. Sorry I'm going so long. And this is a good one. And, and to be honest with you, I really struggled with the wording on this one, but this is it. I wanted to say poo-poo on, <laughs> on, your, on your opposition, but I didn't say that. Um, put down your resistance swiftly and boldly. Put down your resistance swiftly and boldly. Notice what he does here in verses 19 and 20. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite, every time you read those names, you ought to hear in your head, boo, hiss, hiss, hiss. All right? Just I want you to get the picture here, okay? When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite, servant of Geshem the Arab, heard it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? You know, the king, Artaxerxes, the king that gave uh, Nehemiah permission to go back, had also made a law that no one was going to rebuild that wall. So he rescinded that law that he had made earlier. What is this thing that you were doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And then notice this. And then I replied. And notice what he does. The God of heaven will make us prosper. And we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. An effective leader doesn't spend, expend, waste, sideways energy in dealing with opposition. An effective leader recognizes opposition and puts it down and gets back to the work. That's what he did. That's what he did. He didn't waste a lot of time. He didn't waste a lot of energy. He didn't waste a lot of effort. He said, listen, you guys, God's going to prosper us, Ed. And so you just sit down and get out of the way. And you know what they did? They backed off. They came back. And we're going to talk about that next week about leadership at a crossroads, how does a leader handle opposition as we dive into that a little bit more deeply. All right, let's break through the table, spend some time around the questions, and uh, then we'll come back in a few minutes and wrap it all up. up we're not going to get out of here today that's the present reality listen I apologize for going long on the front end I know it cuts short the table talk a little bit we're so appreciative that you're here today and you know uh, there is a there's a little bucket in the back on your way out today if this has been a blessing to you and you'd like to support one thing uh, help underwrite the cost a little bit go ahead and drop something in that basket that would be great Jorge Rodriguez was a very well-known bank robber who lived just across the border into Mexico from Texas. He would oftentimes cross the Rio Grande into the state of Texas, rob a bank, and then rush back across the river to Mexico. For what seemed like an eternity, Texas Rangers tried everything they could to apprehend Jorge Rodriguez, but he was just too good. Except there was one day when one of the Texas Rangers actually spotted Jorge as he had robbed a bank and was crossing the river back into Mexico. 
communication in that day. He didn't have cell phones and he didn't have time to get the rest of the posse together. So he decided on his own to follow him. And he did just that to a little town right across the border into a small cantina. He walked into that cantina very quietly, very stealthily. Jorge was over at the bar. He came up to him, put a gun to the back of his head, and he said, I know that you are Jorge Rodriguez. I want you to tell me right now where all of the money is that you have been stealing from the banks in Texas, or I am going to blow your brains out. Then all of a sudden, the ranger realized that he had a problem. There was a communication problem because Jorge didn't speak English and he didn't speak Spanish. A young, small Mexican fella jumped up to the Texas Ranger's help, spoke very good English. And so the Texas Ranger told him, you tell Jorge exactly what I just said and you get the information as to where that money is right now. So this young man explains to Jorge what the ranger had said. And so Jorge tells the young man, tell the big Texas ranger to go to the city square. There is a fountain there. On the north side of that fountain, count down five bricks. There is a loose brick, pull it out, and all the money is there. I have not spent one single cent. So that young man then interprets back to the Texas Ranger, Jorge Rodriguez is a brave man and he is willing to die. <laughs> so there's some motivation going on here, a lot of different motivation from a lot of different angles, right? You know, uh, Christine, who works in Ryan and Ron's office, does the, uh, the cards. And uh, I was in a meeting on uh, Wednesday when she called me and uh, left a message. And so I didn't get back to her for like an hour and a half, two hours, till I had a break at the, the lunchtime in this meeting. And uh, she said, you know, the, the first question says, what are some reasons that motivation leaks? And she goes, that just doesn't make sense to me. So she made the decision to, to change it to lax. And she said, I just sent that out to everybody about three minutes ago when I had called. And I said, you know, Christine, the truth of the matter is, is motivation leaks. It's kind of like you poke a hole in a bucket. Uh, the water is going to leak out of the bucket. It may not leak out fast, but it's going to leak out eventually and completely. And the fact of the matter is, is motivation does leak. I said, that's really what I want. And so she sent it back out to the table leaders because that's exactly what we meant. To picture it, it's kind of like this. The brand new calendar year turns over, and you're all jazzed up about getting into shape, losing weight, going to the gym and working out. And so you who have been going to the gym for all these years, all of a sudden, January 2nd, you walk into the gym, and you can't find a machine anywhere because there are people everywhere who you've never seen before. And there are lines of people, and they got this little piece of paper there that signs up and you put your name on, you're like eight, you know, like good night. I'm going to be three and a half hours before I even get on this thing to get some exercise. Well, if you keep going back at about week two, it's a little bit easier. Week three, it's a little bit easier still. Week four, it's like it was back in December. Why is that? It's because motivation leaks. Now, there are three kinds of motivation. There's external motivation. I'm going to motivate you with some outside means. There's internal motivation and working it up from within, which is good. But the very best motivation is eternal. Eternal motivation. Seeing everything in light of eternity. You know, unfortunately, we live our lives focused on that small period of time known as the 70 or 80 years we have here on this earth, maybe 85, maybe 100, I don't know. I met with somebody yesterday who's providing care for my mom in the assisted living center. She said, my oldest patient was 112. Holy cow. 
On her 112th birthday, she came into the place that, that she was living. She bought her a brand new dress. She's going to dress her up because the media is going to come. They're going to have a big celebration, the 112-year birthday. She walks in the room to get her dress and put her makeup on. The lady looks at her and says, I think I'll wear my red robe today. And so this lady says, oh, come on. I, I forgot what the lady's name was. She says, I bought you this brand new dress. The media pe people are coming just to see you. It's going to be a great day. She looked at her and said, I am 112 years old. If I want to go out there stark naked, I'll do it. So wisely, the lady backed off, and she said, okay, you go ahead and get yourself ready. And she wore her red robe that day. I don't know why I told you that, but <laughs> 112 years may seem like an eternity. Remember, Ron did an illustration and tied a rope, went through here, and he put, a, I think, a, a ribbon or something on He said, that represents your life. If you're motivated by eternity, you see everything from God's perspective. You see it totally differently. I love what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 33. He said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all this other stuff that you've been after, oh, I'll give you what you need. I even give you more than you need. I give you some of what you want. But I'll take care of you when you have the eternal perspective. When you're motivated for the long term, For eternity. You know, we've not spent much time talking, but I can't help but think this morning, what are the walls in your life today that are broken down? What relationships have been burned? What rubble is so mounded up in your life that the animal that you're riding on can't even walk through because of it? Would you do business with Jesus today? Maybe your marriage hasn't been the priority it ought to be. Maybe the pursuit of a dollar bill has been more important to you than the investment you would make into your children. Maybe today there's a habitual sin that to be honest with you, you, if you were talking to one of the guys around the table, you said, I got this little thing. But the truth of the matter is, is you've had that little thing for decades in your life and you have not gotten the victory over it yet. It's rubble. The wall is broken down. I think the greatest thing that motivated Nehemiah was the glory of God. Because people looked at Jerusalem and said, you said the God of heaven was your God and look at us. We knocked you down and out and you can't even build it back up. And Nehemiah said that is a blow against the glory of God. When people look at your life, would they say of you, above all things I could say about him, he lives for the glory of God. I don't know of anything that could better be said of you as a dad, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, as an employee, Whatever it is that you do, motivation leaks. So you got to keep filling it up every day by spending time alone with the master. Can I pray for you? Father, you have challenged us, and hopefully today you have equipped us once again. You are spurring us on through one another to love you, to serve you, and to live for you more today than we did yesterday. And I pray, Father, when we come back next week, we could honestly say as we look each other eyeball to eyeball around the tables that I'm a little bit more like Jesus this week than I was last week because that's what growing in Christ is all about. Father, help us to stay motivated for the eternal things that matter most. And when the opposition comes against us, help us to recognize it and deal with it so that we could be the men of God that you are calling us to be 
Lord, when I look around a room like this with so many men, with such giftedness and such passion, I cannot help but think but that our region should be impacted in a magnificent way for your glory. And for whatever the walls are in each of our lives, I pray that you would help us to see it as that and to do business with you so that we could get those walls rebuilt for your glory. It's in Jesus' name.